beauty is the very thing you need because beauty is the thing that causes people to lean in and to care about what it is that they're seeing and to want to pursue it. What's up, people? You're listening to A Quick Read, an advertising podcast that talks book smarts and street smarts with the people who have been there, done that. Today's guest is Leland Moshemeyer. He is the co-founder of the revered branding firm Collins, former chief brand officer of Chobani, and a World Economic Forum young global leader. We talk art, economics, and society. You know what to do. Tune in and turn up. Hey, what's up, Leland? How you doing, man? I'm great, buddy. How are you? Oh, man, I am so good. I have been waiting for this time. I've been waiting for this podcast. Uh, we first met in New Orleans uh, before the pandemic, right? Yeah, that's right. One of one of the last memories I have before everything shut down. <laughs> yeah, we were uh, so so. For those listening, you may or may not know one show who puts on the the, the awards. Uh, they have a an event every year called um, the Creative Directors Retreat, and I went as a sort of a first time creative director, and got to check out all these great speakers and presenters. And one of them uh, happened to be you, and so it was Leland, and he gave this great presentation on how to create a creative culture and one that you know has up curves and not down curves. And it it felt like I was in an economic masterclass. And uh, I really appreciated it. And so, you know, I reached out to you afterwards and we've kind of, you know, chatted ever since. And um, it's been cool. We've been able to keep in touch. And so I'm, I'm, I'm stoked to have you on the show, buddy. Yeah, well, thank you for having me. I've been looking forward to this. I was, every time we've chatted, we've always had an amazing conversation. So I, I expect this to be the same. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. Well, uh, so, so here's the thing. Uh, you picked a crazy book. Like you, now, this doesn't surprise me, right? Because again, you're, you're a deep thinker. And I've uh, had some cool conversations with you in the past, but you ended up picking this book called Unto the Last by John Ruskin. I think it was published in like 1800 something. Um, and this book is quite a doozy. I mean, it was, um, you know, it was controversial in its day. It, it kind of rattled some bones, so to speak. So what was it about this book that's sort of like, a, you know, it's, a, it's an economic book. It's about life. It's about all sorts of stuff, philosophy. Um, this book inspired Gandhi. So what is it about this book that, that really you were like, oh man, this is my book for the show? <laughs> yeah. I, um, so years ago, uh, back in like 2008, I decided I was going to write a book. And I started doing tons. It didn't matter what the, what the subject was, but I started doing a lot of research on it because one key component in the book was a interrogation of what design is. Uh, capital D design, uh, because it, even defining the word design is is contentious among its practitioners and observers and stuff. And so, part of this book was going deep into that. And of course, when you're doing that research, you want to go back to uh, primary resources, the original thinkers of the stuff. And so, as I was doing the research, I kept saying, "Okay, well, where did this idea come from? Cool, I found that. Okay, where did their ideas come from?" And you just kind of follow this trail back. And I came to this gentleman named John Ruskin who was a, a 19th century dilettante, a wealthy child of a wealthish Irish merchant. Um, and what was so interesting about John Ruskin's story was where he came from, what he did, the inciting moment in his life that changed the course of his life, how he tried to take on Victorian capitalism, and the writing he did all around it. Uh, was utterly fascinating to me. Um, and the the impact is far beyond just Gandhi that you mentioned. His impact, uh, I consider him, as do other people, the founding intellectual father of design. Uh, when he was writing, design was not a profession. It was not a thing. It was, it was just art. Um, and his writing inspired William Morris, who created the arts and crafts movement. And the arts and crafts movement is really considered the first movement of design that later went on to inform a lot of the work wounds in Germany, the Art Nouveau, and on forth until you get into Bauhaus and, you know, the rest is design history. And so, this, this guy 
was just absolutely amazing. And there are many books that I can reference about him and many, many things that I can say about him. But the one that I thought best summarized who he was, his impact on society, and the trajectory that he placed many people on was this 99-page book called Unto the Last. Um, And I also, beyond just seeing it as a valuable piece of history, I saw it as something really personal to me because what Ruskin had done as really one of the first people to do this is he tied the knot between the worlds of art and literature and the humanities and economics and created an an entire um, economic philosophy, a natural economic philosophy that challenged the Darwinian capitalism of Victorian England challenged it so much that when he published the book, it was supposed to be one of, I think, four or five different books that were coming out. There was such anger at what he was saying and such vitriol to the publisher and to Ruskin himself that the publisher feared for his own life and refused to publish anything that John Ruskin wanted to to write after that. And in fact, uh, John Ruskin dealt quite severely with the reaction um, and kind of went insane. Uh, wow. And there's a lot of rich story around that as well, but his ideas in the writing are beautiful. He's a poet, so he he could articulate ideas with wonderful metaphor, but he also had the uh, um, uh, sharp intellect to be able to pull apart economic theory at the time and show its flaws without a background in economics. Um, and if you read much of his stuff today, you're like, well, yeah, we do a lot of that today. We We have public education for children. We have Medicare. We have minimum wage. We have, you know, no child labor laws. But back in the day when he was writing about this, that was considered heretical. Um, And so, just there was so much to love about him and this book and the story around it that it's really been one of those um, wells that I've gone back to over and over again for vocabulary, for language, for frameworks, for um, just inspiration in general about my own efforts to kind of uh, in my own small ways, you know, merge the world as, of creativity and economics with each other. Yeah. Wow. Well, and, and I think that's, you know, it's really um, intriguing, you know, to go back to those sources, those original texts. So, you know, you talk about father of design. I mean, you yourself, you know, have a pretty rich history, um, even at your young age when it comes to design. And, and, you know, some of that history that you were talking about there, I can hear that coming out as, as you, uh, you in the past and maybe currently are still a professor in, in, uh, in design um, with the Visual School of Arts. So talk to us and give us a little context for who is Leland because your, your LinkedIn profile is overwhelming. You're, you're on a bunch of boards. There's so many companies. I can't make sense of it. So help us understand who you are and, and how this design world of yours is uh, starting to uh, shape up. You know, if if I had a good answer to that, I'd be able to tell myself that and sleep better at night. But it's a <laughs> it's even a hard question for me to answer. I, look, I think you know, in my own struggles to kind of define that for myself, um, I I've always just said I'm a designer. Okay. And I I go where it takes me. Now, I, I think most listeners, when they hear the word design, they think graphic design, they think fashion design. Dare I say, some might even think like interior decoration. In the sense that design is the decoration on the cake, it's the drapes on the windows. Uh, But for me, design is none of that. Design is a third pillar of human inquiry. And typically, we always talk about two pillars, the humanities and the sciences. I think design is a third and different one. The humanities ask the question of what is important? What do we value in the world? What matters? The sciences ask the question, what is fact? what is provable. Um, And I think between those two is another one called the designs, not design, but the designs, which stands for what is desirable. Where, in other words, where do we, where are we today and where do we want to be? And I think the profession of design, lowercase d designs are all dedicated towards creating that intentional change of knowing and recognizing and understanding where we are and then trying to figure out solutions uh, that get us to where we need to go and where we want to be. And I think 
when one looks at design that way, I think it's a much more expansive concept and way, and almost really way of life and, and discovery and learning than, than focusing on de design as just the craft of design. Um, yeah. One of the things that makes design so wonderful is, is, is that it is about craft. Because if you want to move into the future, you have to be able to see the future. You have to be able to articulate it. You have to be able to make people fall in love with it, to have it be beautiful so that they want to move towards it, so that they care about it. And so that's why design is so deeply related and, and critically related to the visual arts, to the aesthetics. Because you, ne you, don't under you can't fully desire something until you can see it uh, and understand it. So... That's how I see the world. That's how I, in many ways, see who I am. And so, I'm, I'm just drawn to these moments of transition and change and um, systemic overhaul. And so, it's, it's what drew me to Chibani. It's what inspired me to start um, Collins. It's what inspired me to co-found uh, the seaweed plastics company Sway and on down the line. And so, for other people, it looks like I'm all over the board. But for me, I'm like, I'm doing the same thing in all these companies. I'm creating and managing uh, the transitions from one phase state to another. I'm designing. Um, and it's challenged me to learn a lot of different things, both in terms of visual communication, uh, business and culture building, um, uh, systems dynamics and causal loop mapping in order to stand intervention points in complex and tractable systems, but also economics. I mean, I deeply see a an important relationship between economics and design. And so, a big part of my uh, life in the last 10 years has really been steeping myself in the world of economics and seeing whether it's a creative culture or a business plan as, as, a, as a design challenge in need of the language and frameworks of economics. So, it's, it's caused me to be this motley person, but at the same time, at least I feel I have a very... Uh, strong center to what I'm being drawn towards, even if it's not the most linear buttoned up story that I'm able to tell people. Yeah, no, I think, you know, and again, you know, being a person who views design as, as almost like a, um, a way of life, that's, that's what it looks like when I, when I look at your career here. Um, so as we jump in, we, we have this conversation and we, we talk and pull out some of these big ideas from the book. Um, I'll just ask you to maybe draw from some of those experiences. So maybe you'll you'll find something that connects to your time at Chobani, maybe with Collins, maybe with some of the the new things you're doing now. If that's cool, does that work for you? Yeah, it does excellent. Okay, cool. So one of the first big ideas, you know, one of the things that you know, because me and you had, were talking about this book that we sort of extracted was this idea of um, design makes hope real. Uh, what do you mean by that? And do you have maybe an anecdote or a story from one of your experiences um, where where that really starts to play out? So I think this goes back to one of the things that I just me mentioned about the necessary and strategic visuality of design. Um, for anyone who is a Star Trek fan, you know that many of the ideas in Star Trek that seemed like wild, fantastical ideas have have been pursued and oftentimes created by, by engineers in our present day. One needs to be able to see what the future is. Um, and when one can see what the future is, there is a, a sense of hope that comes with it. And no future can be built without hope. Um, there's always an argument that, you know, hope is not a strategy, and I 100% agree with that. Hope isn't a strategy, but it's the reason for a strategy. And so... We can't have hope for the things that we can't see. We can't have hope for the things that we don't think are possible or understandable. Um, visuality is deeply underappreciated as a tool for inspiring and galvanizing change. And in fact, I give a, a presentation on oftentimes on the idea of beauty and its practical uses, that it's not a flight from reality and that it's not a... a um, a, a light concern. In fact, it's a it's a concern of grave importance for any kind of change we want to create in the world. And so, if you ever want to create change, if you ever want to move people towards something, beauty is the very thing you need because beauty is the thing that causes people to lean in and to care about what it is that they're seeing and to want to pursue it. And so, when we talk about hope, uh, design making hope visible, 
That's what we're doing. We're talking about creating the architecture of emotion and desire where people are self-propelled into the change rather than standing aside and being pushed into it, um, fighting against that push. Yeah. When, as a co-founder of Collins, when you guys were, you know, when that was starting to sort of incubate and, and how did that, that truth or this, this hope um, play out in that sense? Did you, did you see a future state? Did you guys see a future state and you were like, here's how we get there? Or, you know, how did you guys emerge as a, as a leader? You know, it's one of those things where the cobbler's kid always has the worst shoes. Um, and I, I think part of that is w- with us early on, we wanted so many things and we were so attached to so many pieces of those ideas um, that it was hard to figure out how to add it up to stuff while doing the work and, and handling lots of other challenges. So it wasn't like the idea for Collins, you know, was born like Athena from our head and fully formed and and ready to go. It was something that just sort of came about over time as we looked at the work we were doing, as we looked at where our energy was most excited. We knew that when we started it, we we wanted to do something of significance. And eventually what we landed on uh, as our kind of core ethos of the company and kind of core drive was to do incredible craft at incredible scale. That is a concept that for us is is a mixing of oil and water. The bigger you get, oftentimes the lower the quality of the ideas get because you have to make it palatable to so many different people, whether inside a company or outside a company. Um, Whereas in the opposite direction, the more craft oriented you get, the more obsessed you get over the craft work and stuff, the less oftentimes strategic the work is, the less important it is to to the destinies and the trajectories of companies and the people in them. Um, it, you know, because craft oftentimes isn't associated with strategy. And so we wanted to, as an organization, resolve that tension, recognize it, but hold it together and use that kind of tension as a way to challenge and push organizations into better places that either they knew they wanted to go into or they didn't yet know they wanted to go into. And so that's what the idea of incredible craft at incredible scale represents for us. It is it is the fundamental pillars of creating that significant change for for organizations. Um, You know, we've seen it in organizations with Spotify where uh, with our engagement and our client partners, we were able to, through a marketing department in a tech company, which you know is uncommon, by the way, mm-hmm. help that organization transform from an, from a culture that saw itself as a um, as an engineering firm focused on streaming music, a bunch of engineers streaming music, into a member of music culture mm. that was that was strengthening the bonds between fan and musician by, by a more direct relationship, and yeah. that's how that's how it played out when we reimagined the brand. I mean, we we literally took the codes and cues from the world of music, the dynamism, the experimentation, the the diversity and the vividness of it, and found a way to bring that into uh, the Spotify culture and the Spotify brand language. And, you know, it wasn't overnight, but it was pretty quick that the culture started looking at that and goes, I want that. I like yeah. that. That's really cool. Because it, it was, they were no longer engineers making me- streamable music. They were now um, members of the of the music culture, advancing music um, and bringing in technology, just like a a beatbox or a, a turn disc or a violin. Like any instrument is is technology. Yeah. And so music and technology go deeply hand in hand with each other. So they they couldn't understand the fact that they were a part of the history and the trajectory of music culture until they were able to see it through the lens of a, a vividly and dynamically brought to life brand. Um, and you know uh, they've they've done an amazing job stewarding that idea and the brand identity system and the story that we helped develop for them um, over the years since. Yeah, that's great. You know, what I'm hearing there is that, you know, it's about understanding what, what a brand stands for, what people are, you know, really believe in. You know, going back to John Ruskin, um, 
He writes in the book, uh, five great intellectual professions relating to daily necessities um, of life have existed. Three exist necessarily. He, he goes on, he talks about um, the soldier's profession is to defend it, the pastor is to teach it, the physician to keep it in health, the lawyer to enforce justice, and the merchant to provide for. And then he goes on and he finishes and he says that, um, you know, it's not just about what you do. And he says, the soldier, rather than leave his post in battle, he would die. The physician would rather die than leave his post in a plague. The pastor, rather teach than falsehood. The lawyer, rather uh, countenance than injustice. The merchant, what is his due occasion of death, he asks. So this was what I thought was really interesting, right? So we're in advertising, we're in branding, and here we are, these merchants, these people who sell things and make things for people. And, and, and Ruskin begs to ask the question, what is his due occasion for death? You know, this is the question that the merchant, uh, you know, has to answer, you know? And then he goes on to say that uh, the man who does not know when to die does not know how to live. And, and that really is kind of what I heard you saying there is that you guys were able to extract some, some deeper meanings and another lens from which somebody like Spotify to look through and go, hey, we're much bigger than just some engineers. We're a part of culture, of art, of music. And I thought that was kind of an interesting thing that connects back to what Ruskin was talking about. But that's the kind of way he, he writes. And, and I assume that's some of the stuff that you were drawn to as you, you know, read this book and thought about how it relates to your world, you know, sort of that poetic prophet. Um, would you agree with that? I, you know, I love that you picked out that quote. Um, that is one of the many quotes that has really stuck with me and resonated over time. Uh, what is the thing that you are willing to fall on your sword for because you believe it to be the utmost important value worthy of defense in your life? And certainly one can take that to to extremes of like literally dying, and, and there are occasions of that. Um, but there's also metaphorical deaths as well. And I think that that question that Ruskin asks in that is a really important one because it's a really quick way to figure out where your center is and what you're doing. Um, when Within the context of, of brand building and stuff, I've never really applied it in that, in, in the, in, in that sense um, uh, because it, th that can obviously take the question to a very negative place or the conversation to a very negative place quickly. And I think oftentimes clients have a hard time talking about it through that lens with the brand specifically. Um, but the idea there is what, and, and probably this is more brand friendly language, but what is the value with which you want to amplify in the world? Mm. Um, what is it that is most crucial to your soul as a company that if this were violated, you would no longer be a company anymore? Yeah. Uh, and I've always found that that values focused approach, not purpose driven, not your why, but a values focused is, is one of the most important ways to understand an individual, a company, a culture, a community, a body of people, and so on. Um, because that's, that's the glue that holds these, mm -hmm. these uh, collectives together and gives them shape and gives them pattern, gives them thrust, gives them norms. Um, you know, when I was uh, with Chibani and trying to figure out uh, that brand very early on, um, there was a lot of really wonderful contradictions in, in the brand of Chibani that when I saw them, I knew they were sort of the, the necessary kindling for a, for a great brand we're at not the time. We're not talking uh, about like flavor combinations here, are we? No, 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 no. Just like <laughs> it, it was a brand that both wanted to bring forward traditional, natural, simple food, but at the same time, and, and had that kind of like traditionalness to it, but at the same time, it wanted to be a progressive company, breaking boundaries, standing out, uh, changing things. And so, you know, the tradition and progressivism were just one uh, sort of tension within the brand. And, and again, tensions are good because that's the source of creativity. Um, and one of the things that I wanted to help Chobani do in its pursuit of becoming a modern food company was to help it understand itself in a broader context. Um, there's a great quote from Elio Saarinen, who is a Finnish architect, the father of another famous Finnish architect named Eero Saarinen, who designed, if anyone's listening, is from New York, designed the, uh, uh, the JFK airport, the TWA airport at JFK. 
um, among many other things, including the tulip chair. But the quote goes basically like this. It says, if you want to design a chair, think about the room that it's in. If you want to design a room, think about the house. If you want to design a house, think about the block. If you want to design a block, think about the city and on and on. And there's always a next larger context to be thinking about um, when considering what you're focusing on. And, and not only is that for me a, a sort of life lesson in anything that I'm doing, but I think it's also very valuable when one is think taking on any kind of project. And in this case with Chobani, it was about thinking about Chobani as a food company in the context of food writ large. That meant food culture, food philosophy, food trends, food uh, niches and subcultures, food rituals, and so on. And in the pursuit of that, I started looking at all these different kind of uh, communities that emerged. Obviously, there's the slow food movement, there's the gastronauts, there's, um, uh, they don't really have a name, but kind of like the body optimizers, sort of the, um, mm -hmm. the, the quant jocks of, of self-improvement. Um, but obviously, there was also uh, the food, food movement in general, kind of writ large. And I come across this paper from this one scientist not a scientist, I guess he was more of like a cultural critic, um, who, who basically called out in very academic language what the purpose of the food movement was. And to paraphrase, he basically said that the food movement is to take care of all life on the planet and that food is the most radically transformative way to do that. And when I saw that, I thought that was so profound and also something that could be said of Chibani's ambitions as well. And so, what I saw was an alignment between the, the, the internal myths and the narratives and the articulated ambitions of Chibani with a larger community. And there, in shared in between them was this very simple notion that, at least I felt, this is the way I articulated it, um, that goes actually back to Buckminster Fuller, which is this idea of universal wellness. This very simple idea, as Buckminster Fuller has articulated it, <clears throat> excuse me, that uh, we have enough technology, enough resources, and enough know-how to take care of every single person on the planet. <clears throat> and Buckminster was looking at essentially the whole economy of stuff. Like if we had the will to do it, we could take care of every single person on the planet. Uh, but in the food movement, they were looking at it not as like an economic activity. They were looking at it as a simple like agrarian activity, food distribution activity, active and ritual around food activity. And they were looking at not just humans, but they were looking at all forms of life on the earth and, and pulling it all back to the way that we grow our food, eat our food, and dispose of our food. And I thought that was both epic, profound, but also very specific at the same time. So, the kind of, sort of central value that I felt – and, and, and this is what drove much of my thinking with the organization that I felt really drove Chobani to be the company that it is and, and propel it forward in all its actions, is this pursuit of universal wellness. That that was the value that it wanted to fall on its sword for, that it was willing to sacrifice profit for that. And maybe that's probably the better way to talk about it with brands is not so much death, but what profit are you willing to sacrifice to defend and uphold a particular value? Wow. And in Chobani's case, it was universal. It is universal wellness. Yeah. And I think that's a tough question to ask, right? And that's, that's where, you know, it kind of brings up to, to the second point. It takes leadership if you're going to ask tough questions like that. You know, if you're going to work with, with clients and brands and, you know, no matter how big or small, to challenge, you know, something as bold as that takes leadership. You know, I hear that in your voice, um, a sense of confidence. And it, the next idea that you sort of extract from, from the book is you've, you've drawn upon this idea of leader as designer, uh, the modern model of leadership. Um, how do you see that? I mean, how, you know, I, I can hear it in your voice. We can see it in your resume. You've clearly stepped up in leadership roles. Um, but what does that look like for, you know, for the, let's just say the, the common listener of this show, like, you know, maybe they haven't, you know, um, had some of the opportunities you've had. They're at their first agency and here they are, they've been named uh, ACD or creative director or senior copywriter. How do they step into leadership as a designer in this new model? What does that look like? It's a great question. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll start with the book uh, so we can continue to use that as the spine. 
of this conversation. So John Ruskin was an artist. He wrote poetry, he drew, he literally went around the country teaching people how to draw because he thought it would open up their sensibilities and hearts and minds if they were able to draw because then they could see different pieces of the world um, uh, that they were previously blind to. It's the difference between looking and seeing. Um, he also wrote books about architecture and wrote very eloquently about the noble virtues that we can learn from grass, that grass is cut down every day, but then continues to grow despite the frequent and ongoing onslaught of being cut back down. And so, he had just this beautiful poetic way of seeing past the literalness of the world to see the deeper truths and lessons and all around us. But he was, he was disconnected from the realities that were happening, both because of his pursuit of poetry and art, but also because of his economic station in life. And it wasn't until he met um, uh, uh, Thomas Carlyle, who was a Scottish social critic and curmudgeon who was just at his wit's end with the mechanization of life as part of the Industrial Revolution in Europe. And he wrote these tirades, these beautifully written tirades about how the machines were destroying uh, our lives and our world. And in fact, um, when Thomas and uh, John Ruskin met each other, they did not like each other for mm -hmm. reasons that are probably self-apparent as, as the way I'm talking to you. One's a dilettante, one's a hardened, callous social critic. Um, and eventually, they just kept meeting each other in these social circles. And slowly, through small talk, they started to discover that they cared about many of the same things. They just approached it differently. Thomas Carlyle wanted to go at it hard and angry and with pointed uh, language, call out these atrocities and define the problem. Ruskin was going at it through art, teaching people to feel, to have uh, pathos in a way that they didn't before. Um, and while their, their strategies were wildly different and, and almost uh, um, in conflict with each other on the surface, they both cared about the same thing. Yeah. They both wanted to save society. And it, and it was once they discovered that in each other that they, they formed a very strong bond. And what Carlyle taught Ruskin very overtly was that he needed to, as he said in one letter, redirect your attention from staring at the, the mountains and the skies and look into the valley where, this, where as, as they were called back then, the satanic mills churn, dulling men's eyes, crushing their intellect and otherwise destroying the natural earth and beauty all around. And when, and when John Ruskin looked into these valleys that were pumping out uh, these dull mines and, uh, and, and dulled landscapes from the pollution, he got really angry and he said, mm -hmm. I've wasted my entire life um, just focusing on beauty. It's not that he, not that beauty was never important to him, but he's like, there were more important things that I should have been focusing my energy on. And so, he turned to, to the issues underlying, um, he, he picked up Thomas Carlyle's cause and he, like a, like a, like a knight that has just mounted its horse with a, with a giant sword in his hand and armor all over <laughs> him. Thomas Carlyle slapped the back of the steed and on went, you know, John Ruskin riding into the valley to attack the, the dragon. I mean, that was very much the, <laughs> the sensibility of what was going on. And what Thomas and what John Ruskin did was he brought a spirit of creativity, uh, reframing, um, beautiful, colorful, insightful language into dialogues that never had that before and were never challenged by more expansive and systemic ways of thinking. And so, John Ruskin was really poking a bear to try and create significant change. And he, he tried all these different ways to do it. He, you know, obviously he was wealthy, but to kind of create this change in, in the economy was very difficult because of the entrenched systems, the entrenched philosophies, the sort of um, sensibilities of the public at the time. So, he used language, he used argumentation, he would go and testify in court in favor of workers and stuff. And so, he pulled out every trick that he could to figure out how to create this type of change. And I think there's something really true about that to the very nature of design. Design concerns itself with 
all the different ways that are necessary to create change. Some are off the shelf and pre-existing and just applied in new contexts, and some actually require real genuine ingenuity and multiple ways of challenging and engaging the product. But what design does is, is it's flexible, it's fluid, it looks at the problem, it understands it from first principles, and it goes at it from the prince from the structure of first principles. It does not accept the structure as uh, truth, as fact, or as immovable. And that was very much John Ruskin's idea. And in fact, why, that's why he wrote unto the last. He was attacking the first principles of economics, or 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 essentially economics of that day. And so when we when we think about leading as a designer, a designer needs to understand those first principles. A designer needs to try to frame and reframe challenges to be able to unlock intervention points and opportunities for change to be able to respond to contexts that are always full of overwhelming information that isn't adding up to much stuff, that's always under time constraints and resource constraints, and always challenged to create win-win outcomes for everyone. Thinking like a designer, thinking in that systemic relational first principles ways is, in my opinion and others, one of the most profound ways of breaking through the miasma, the inertia, and the stagnancy of the status quo. And so that's what it means to, to lead like a designer. And there's, there's obviously so much that can be said underneath that, so I'm keeping it at sort of a, a top level. But that's, that's, the, that's the starting point for thinking like a designer. You're not an operator. You are a change agent as a designer. And sometimes that change agent can happen at a project level. Sometimes it can happen on a personal level. Sometimes it can happen on an institutional level. Um, but that's what it means to, to uh, lead as a designer. Yeah. Do you ever, do you think back on your career thus far? Um, and can you think of any moments or is there a moment where you felt like that truly manifested for you and you were like, okay, like this is, this is now like, this is real for me. Like I understand, like, you know, it's one thing to, to read books and to challenge mm -hmm. and think about leadership in different ways, but is there a place in your career where you had an opportunity where you were able to step up and lead and you were able to do what you just were, were describing to us? So in a way, your question is, when was the first time you saw the matrix? <laughs> that you were in? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, you know, I, I do have one moment that has continued to stick with me, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll lightly tell it just for brevity. It was a moment when I was early in, in my career, and uh, a boss of mine at the time, we were working on something together, and I challenged him. I go, well, wait, why would we, why would we say that? We don't have any data to back that up. And he paused, looked at me, and he goes, they've hired us because to be experts. We don't have to justify everything that we say. And then he paused and again, he said, and you have to remember, everything's made up. And we went back and we were, we continued to work on the thing that we were working on. And that has always stuck with me. And it's been another one of those, uh, profound small statements that allowed me being a fish to see the water that I was in. Um, and, you know, I, I think we've, all of us spend our whole lives either being explicitly or implicitly told that life is a test, you know, whether you're sitting down to literally take a test in school or you're trying out for a sport or you're on a date or you're, um, in like a fight with a friend or something or a job interview, everything's a test. And there's an assumption with a test that there's right answers that there is a, a pre-established proper way of doing it that you haven't figured out yet and you're still learning, that it is on you to uncover the right answers um, and so on. There's, there's just a lot of richness of implication downstream for, for seeing the world as a test. Um, the problem with that is I think when you see the world as a test, you always see yourself as never in a position to lead. You always see yourself in a position to still need to learn more. I still need to, and I've, I've been there. I, I'm, yeah. I'm not ready yet. I, there's so much more I need to do. I need to read this book. I need to read that book. I need to have that experience before I can really step in and, and take the reins of something. And oh, by the way, like 
you know, there's all these smart people around me who clearly have it all together. And by the way, I feel like I'm still learning and I'm still behind on everything. And they all look like they have it figured out, man, that's really depressing. I must really suck. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so, yeah. there's all these sort of these consequences of it. But that comment that uh, my boss at the time said to me kind of made me realize, because I spent a lot of time thinking about it over the years, that, you know, really life is more like an artwork. It's a blank canvas. And it is a world inviting you to put your mark on it. And when you see the world as a canvas wanting your voice, wanting your mark on it, you feel much freer to take action. You feel much freer of asking questions like, why or how come or that doesn't seem right um it is it is liberating to see it in that way and also give your permit self permission to try and fail without being too hard on yourself and that was for me when i really started feeling like i could see the matrix and to start to move in the world and take action in the world and have impact in the world beyond what I thought I could when I was younger. And that's manifested in literally everything that I've done. It manifested in the way that I started calling. I was 26. I never started a company. <laughs> I've, pff, I had no idea what I was doing, but I was like, I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to figure it out with my business partner, Brian Collins. Uh, it was same thing with why I started writing a book in 2008. I'd never written a book. I didn't know any author, uh, writers or authors. Um, I mean, you just literally go on down the line where where you just say, like, I'm just going to start doing stuff, and then the painting, yeah. the image, the, the composition will emerge from it. And it's it's been great, and it's it's been a, a wildly rewarding experience. And again, connecting it back to Unto the Last, I think that's what John Ruskin did as an artist, literally looking at um, you know, arches in, in Gothic cathedrals, looking at blades of grass and being able to draw out from them art lessons of art, life, and um, and psychology. He he didn't see the world as a test. He everything to him was a canvas, and he he ran down into those into that valley full of satanic mills with a giant bucket of paint in hand and a paintbrush, just swinging it wildly, putting his mark on everything, and. You know, while he had a very difficult experience doing that, he he changed the course of a lot by doing that. Um, everyone from Gandhi on down, as you mentioned. Mm. Man, this is such a great conversation, man. So much to think about, so much for people to sort of uh, sort of resonate with. Um, but when we talk about leadership, and you know, we've talked about you know, design is hope. We've talked about leadership as a designer. I think a lot of us, you know, look in, and say, okay, this is, you know, this is great, guys. You're having this big philosophical conversation. You're referencing books from the 1800s. You sound really smart. Um, is this even scalable? You know, I think that's really the next question or the next thing that we look to is, um, can you build this sort of machine for scalable creativity? And that's what was so exciting about the talk I heard you give at the um, the one show uh, for uh, creative directors retreat is you talked about s- how to scale creativity and that really awakened me in an exciting way and I've been able to um, practice some of those things with our team and how we're able to you know generate um, you know positive curves for creativity so talk a little bit about that that concept and and how that's been you know really um, impactful in in what in the work you've been doing in the past several years. Yeah, and I think this is a, a really great setup because I agree with you. Like, um, I love theory and I love abstraction and I love philosophy, but I love it only in as it relates to the practicalities of of day to day. If we if we were to ever have another podcast like this, I would I would actually reference uh, Goethe as the as the uh, writer that we would talk about for the other book because he he had much the same philosophy and it's one of the reasons why he went into government uh, in in what in the Weimar Republic because he even though he wrote one of the most wonderful books uh, and one of the best sellers of in his period um, about poetry and art and love and death um, he was like, this is insane. All these people are just too obsessed with art. I want something practical and real. I want to go fix potholes for the Weimar Republic. And so that's what he did to have mm-hmm. that side of it. And I'm the same way. I oscillate between 
you know, these philosophical, high-minded books, and then very practical books like pricing strategy, for example, <laughs> um, or, or organizational design and stuff like that. So, for me, it's, it's very important to connect this stuff back to the day-to-day. And that presentation that you saw in New Orleans was exactly one of those things, because for me, and, and, for one, and, and frankly, one of the challenges that John Ruskin had was trying to externalize, uh, attach, and scale his thinking into a broader pre-existing and hardened ecosystem. And that's one of the big challenges of design. It's great that you have this idea, but can you mobilize? Um, can you create that shift that scales over time? And what are the ways that you do that? Um, certainly building a culture that embraces that is really important. So I've spent a lot of time paying attention to and learning about incentives, uh, learning about balancing and feedback loops within organizations, organizational structure, team design, all sorts of things like that. And when you and, and that particular presentation that you saw was to take an economic lens and take a look at culture as a marketplace where I'm trying to remember much of the presentation, where mm-hmm. it wasn't about culture in the terms of like ethos and values and purpose. I think that's a that's an important lens. It's just a different lens. When we're talking about culture as a economic system, when we're talking about business, individual businesses as as micro economies in of themselves, you start to ask different questions and see different types of activities. So for me, when I look inside a business, I don't. I, I, what I see is a, an exchange of information, yeah. an idea exchange, where you have sellers and buyers around ideas. And the buyers have to understand that an idea has a payoff for them for before they buy that idea with their social equity, meaning giving their name to an idea, giving their an idea or, get, or giving their time or, or financial resources to an idea. And yeah, let's, pa- let's pause here for just a second and, and just unpack this a little bit because this was a, a big concept for me. So what we're talking about here, guys, as you listen, is think of a transaction between, say, maybe your copywriter and an art director. And the copywriter is really excited. They're on a project. Um, they come over and they say, hey, um, I've got this idea. And they run this line by the art director. And at that point in time, the, the copywriter is offering something up. And the art director has the, the ability to, to do something with that. And you know, much like you were talking about being able to put their name to it, and one of the things you talked about in the, in the presentation as you talk about creating an economy is you have several choices. One choice is you could just say, um, you know, oh, yeah, great, you know, uh, cool story, bro. And then you move on. And then you ultimately demoralize the copywriter and that idea dies because essentially, you know, there's no way for it to sort of evolve or, or live on. The other thing you talked about was you could sort of um, – what you called paper pushing it, where you kind of say, "Oh yeah, that's that's pretty cool." Uh, you know, go show go show Johnny over there. You know, you're kind of getting them out of your way. You're kind of moving on, and and the idea kind of lives on a little bit, but it kind of stagnates and it doesn't really, you know, no, no no real value is added to it. It's sort of you know, it's still the same idea, but you know, maybe some other people hear it, but it's not really, you know, anything's not really happening with it. And then there's this other idea where you sort of add to it, where the art director goes, "Huh." That's interesting. Um, what if this this also was added to it, or what if this? You know, what if you thought about it this way? Now all of a sudden, the idea sort of transforms a little bit, and then that art director, you know, now they have some equity, and they're kind of like, okay, now I'm a part of this idea. So now instead of one person with one idea, you have two people with one idea, and then that thing can sort of spread. There was some idea around that exchange of of transformation. So. Um, if I if I mess that up, you know, correct it. But I feel like that was you know a, a key understanding of that sort of micro interaction. But that was perfectly said and perfectly <laughs> captured from uh, over a year ago. <laughs> so I'm both honored and impressed at the same time. Um, you're 100 percent right. I mean, it's it is it is the selling and building of capital under ideas, and the more effectively that people within an organization are trained to earn that capital, social capital or literal capital under an idea, the more that 
people who are capital owners, equity owners within the organization are trained to understand ideas, engage with ideas, um, evaluate ideas. The more likely you are to have essentially market transactions in the economy, more people yeah. buying into other people's ideas and transforming them to make them better and advance them to the next stage. And so the more successful ideas are the ideas that end up getting executed because they have the most right. equity, social or financial or otherwise, underneath them. And w that creates a short cycle of successful execution where the, you know, the C-suite says, oh my gosh, this was a wonderful initiative. Let's do it again. <laughs> and then, so you do the same thing. Uh, a a, let's take a designer. A designer shares something with an account manager. The account manager loves it, shares it with the next person who loves it, and on. And you do another short cycle. You do enough of those short successful cycles, and all of a sudden you have a long arc, a long cycle called yeah. momentum, called a vibrant, thriving, creative culture. Yeah. Now, what economics also teaches us is that with every long bull cycle, there inevitably is a crash. There's a market correction. And the same thing happens within organizations. I, I call it the Icarus effect, whereby mm. such success happens so frequently that people begin to take it for granted, that they begin to say, oh, you know what? I thought this idea through enough. Let's, let's do it. And there's a sense of hubris that enters in where there's less diligence on an idea. There's higher tolerance for risk because you're always trying to outdo your previous idea. And yeah. there's, um, there's, there's less uh, oversight on the idea to kind of like work through the, the risky parts of it. And eventually something bad happens when you launch it. Either an idea was stolen from, uh, from some other artist or company or whatever, whether intentionally or unintentionally, or it plops in the marketplace. And all of a sudden, um, that hubris turns into anxiety, even fear. And all of a sudden, people are like, whoa, that was a major bomb. And all of yeah. a sudden, all the rules and the, uh, and the elders come down and say, we need policies and and checkpoints to make sure this never, ever happens again. This was a terrible PR moment or whatever. Or we lost a huge client uh, because of this, or the client's really pissed off. We can never let this happen again. And all of a sudden, uh, uh, market harming activity pops in, fear, anxiety, over yeah. corrections in terms of risk management. And all of a sudden you're now in a plummet, a, a very, very fast plummet. And people do what they do in marketplaces. They begin to stop buying. They begin to um, yeah. you know, not be as aggressive or have a high risk tolerance and so on with ideas that you're moving through. And it's really hard to pull out of that because yeah, people's well, enthusiasm it, wanes for, for challenging ideas that, that will show profit. And frankly, there is no profit creatively or otherwise without risk. So there has yeah. to be risks taken. And when you're in that free fall, no one wants to take a risk. And sure, that's, they're that's like, the Icarus effect. Yeah, they're like, I'm not, I'm not going to push forth this idea. Hey, I think, the, I think the intern or I think this junior writer or I think this you know, senior uh, designer has this amazing idea, but I'm not going to vouch for it because I don't want to be fired. <laughs> you know, exactly. It starts to, th that's where that fear starts to come into play. And then that creates almost you know, this spiral of death where it's like, you know, you, the, the organization almost can't become creative at all. And I think we've seen this, you know, when we look at big markets and small markets, we can all think of the beloved storied agencies of the past, right? That were once, oh, they were once the best agency in town and now they're out of business, right? And so it's like, you can see that across, you know, our industry where this effect has, has come into play. And I know that, you know, in my, in my own agency here, you know, we've, we've seen, we've seen these things sort of evolve and these curves sort of happen. And um, so when I walked away from that, that conference, I was like, okay, how do I, how do I do this? And so, you know, we really manifested and focused, you know, in 2020, you know, right when the pandemic, I came back from that conference, here I am trying to be a creative director. I've got a toolkit of things um, that, that, that I, that I'm going to try to bring to the table. This was one of them. And I said, okay, well, let's focus on, um, empathy and abundance. Let's try to feel and understand each other and what, what kind of world they come from. And then let's imagine a world where everybody is allowed to be brilliant in the room. And I felt like, okay, those are two things that seem to play into this philosophy. 
And so for a whole year, we preached that, and we just leaned in together as a group. And we actually were lucky. In 2020, we actually grew. We, hadn't, we didn't have to furlough anyone. We actually closed some new business. And I really do believe, I, I'm telling you, and I thank you so much, I really do believe it's because I was so aggressive um, of being such a cheerleader for this concept where everybody can be brilliant in the room, everybody has ideas to offer, and together um, you know, we can, we can listen to one another and, and build something great. And, and it did create those moments of transaction that then over time gave us a nice little curve. And, and at least for 2020 was a nice um, creative curve that, that produced a lot of great results. So thank you, my friend. Thank you. Well, it's, uh, it's amazing to hear that type of stuff because, you know, that's, that's, that's why I and other people like myself kind of share these ideas is to actually put them into practice. You know, we certainly do it in our own practices, but, you know, hearing great stories from, from someone like yourself uh, of their success is, uh, it's, it's, it's awesome to hear. Genuinely awesome. Yeah, man. And I, I really appreciate it. And, and I think, you know, this brings us to, you know, a lot of, most people on the show, uh, we usually work through about three big ideas, but um, I don't know, sometimes I just, you know, a guy like you, you, you bring a little extra, a little bonus. Um, and I want to sort of end with this final thought, because I think it's just a nice little touch towards the end of this conversation is um, the practical value of beauty, right? So, you know, we're in an industry where we get to make things for a living. We get to do stuff. You know, we get to paint things and draw things and write things. And um, sometimes they get chosen. A lot of times they don't. Um, sometimes they are, you know, they feel like a piece of art you can put on the wall. Sometimes they feel like a cereal box. Um, but maybe a cereal box is a piece of art, right? You know, Andy Warhol had a, had, had a, a way to think about those sort of things. So, in your words, the practical value of beauty is what? I am going to borrow from Dostoevsky and say that beauty will save the world. That's the practical value of beauty because it causes you to lean in. It causes you to care. It causes you to see the thing that you're looking at as more than just the literal presentation but as something more significant and more important to you and the world. And that is something that deserves to be spread and shared as far as possible, because beauty is the very thing that the world needs more of. Yeah, that was beautiful, man. That was beautiful. So speaking of uh, beautiful things, man, what, what beautiful things do you have going on right now in your future i know you're you we talked a little bit about career stuff but is there anything that you really want people to know or any any links you want to want them to go check out what's the thing you're you're kind of uh excited about right now oh man yeah <laughs> it's just so many things there are so many so many things um i i continue to be very excited by the trends in the marketplace of the movement towards vision and growth as what the market rewards versus profit. Because I think that kind of macro shift in economic priorities is a uh, huge unlock for creative professionals. Um, it is something that I see opening up the world of opportunity to create uh, transformative change for creative professionals in their work and their economic security and the opportunities that they're afforded, and in the impact that they can have. Um, never before have I seen more companies wanting to figure out how to grow, break past their current structures, their current inertia and status quo that they're in, not for, not for ego reasons, but for real economic uh, driving reasons. Um, and that space of where we are today and where we want to be tomorrow is where, you know, I call it design, but I think that's where all creative people can live. Um, and that is what I'm paying a lot of attention to. That's what I'm most excited about. Man, that's awesome. Uh, if people have been intrigued by this conversation and they're like, who is this guy? What in the world is he about? 
How do they get a hold of you, or where do you send people that are like, hey, how do I learn more, read more, hire you, all that stuff? What do you, where do you send them? I, I would just go to LinkedIn. Um, I mean, I, <laughs> I, I wish I wrote more. I um, had a newsletter or something like that, but yeah. I, I'm, I'm such a bad editor. I have such a bad editor in my head that it's very painful for me to write <laughs> and to publish, so I don't. Uh, so for anyone that wants to reach out to me, uh, LinkedIn is, is the best way to do it. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Well, man, I've really enjoyed this conversation. I hope that you'll, you'll come back, uh, for a future episode, maybe uh season two. Uh, if that's all right, I'd like to give you the open invite, man. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. And, and this was exactly what I thought we were going to do is have a wonderful conversation. You've never, <laughs> you've never let me down on that one. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, man. Well, I'll tell you what, I know you got a lot going on. We really thank you for taking the time. For those of you listening, um, Leland is just so generous uh, with his time. He speaks at a lot of different functions. He's very giving of his knowledge. Um, he is is humble and uh, always willing to learn as well. So um, I just got to say, you're, you're, you're the real deal, man. You're beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it, buddy. Hey there. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. If you did, please subscribe on Spotify, iTunes, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Join the conversation on Instagram at A Quick Read Podcast. See you in two. A Quick Read is a Leap Group Podcast.